for our fourth annual Eric Hilton Chair Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Clint Rapphole, and I'm pleased to let you know I've been here 30 years at the Conrad and Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management and at the University of Houston. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to give you a brief background on our endowed chairs before I introduce our Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Lecturer. <laughs> Our college was the proud recipient of a grant from the Hilton Foundation in 1982 of $21,350,000, which was given to us over a 10-year period. Many things were provided by this grant, for example, a 94,000 square foot addition, which is called the South Wing, which houses laboratories, classrooms, offices, uh, public spaces, the library and archive, and of course, Alumni Hall, within which we were holding this session. And hopefully all of you will be alumni. <laughs> as important as brick and mortar are, however, it should also be noted that there were four endowments provided our college in that grant. And these four endowments were the Conrad M. Hilton Endowed Chair, currently held by Dr. Ron Nikio. Uh, the Baron Hilton Endowed Chair, the first recipient, was Dean, uh, Dr. Alan Stutz. Uh, the Eric Hilton Endowed Chair, yours truly. And believe it or not, the development officer, we have a development officer that has holds an endowed chair. Interestingly enough, the Hilton Foundation told us the first person we were to hire from that endowment would be a development officer. And that is currently held by Mr. Dick the Zuzer. I feel privileged, honored, and am an, extremely proud to be the first recipient of the Eric Hilton Endowed Chair. What is an endowed chair and what does an endowed chair do for our college? An endowed chair assists the college in recruiting outstanding faculty to come to our college. It provides the opportunity to develop a standard of excellence that cannot be achieved only through credit of our generation and state funds. It is a way of keeping score with other hotel colleges. An endowed chair provides salary, it provides benefits, travel, secretarial assistance, and teaching assistance. If managed well, the endowment continues to grow. Today, I believe a chair should be endowed for at least $3 million, although one or $2 million chairs certainly would be accepted. I mention all of this to make you aware of how fortunate our young college is to have three endowed chairs. However, it is necessary that we receive more endowed chairs to maintain our standard of excellence, to keep score, and to remind you of your responsibility and opportunity to help your alma mater become the outstanding college of hotel and restaurant management in the world, and today it's the universe. So with that preface, please allow me to introduce our Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Lecturer, Mr. Gregory Edwards, a 1975 graduate of our college and Senior Vice President Finance, Strategic Planning, and Taxation of the Irvine Company, located in Newport Beach, California. Mr. Edwards, it's always a pleasure to introduce one of our own. And what do I call recall about Mr. Edwards? Many things, all positive. <laughs> He's creative, and was creative, I assume he still is. He's bright, capable, personable, uh, energetic, and I always thought he was very reflective. He was born in Evanston, Illinois, raised in Arizona, and graduated from high school in Scottsdale, Arizona. He was not unacquainted with the hospitality industry as his grandfather owned a restaurant in Paxton, Illinois, called Rusty's Country Fried Chicken, and actually developed eight units. This, of course, Paxton, Illinois, is not far from Kankakee, Illinois, and I know you all know where that is. And his father worked in the lodging side of our business with Disney Hotels, with the Disney Hotel chain, Travel Lodge, uh, Best Western, and the Executive House, where he was purchasing director for all these companies. On his journey to our college, he attended Cornell University for one year and quickly discovered the error of his ways. <laughs> he matriculated at the University of Houston's Conrad and Hilton School of Hotel and Restaurant Management in the fall of 1972 and graduated in May 1975, a very, very good year. My original contact with him was at our office at Caroline and McKinney. None of you really know where Caroline and McKinney is. There may be three or four people in this room that do. At that time, our offices were downtown and we had classes all over campus. 
our new 276,000 square foot facility was not yet available and we would not move in until March of 1974. As we did not know if we could use our new facility for gourmet night, we opted to have the first gourmet night at the Shamrock Hilton. I mention all of this for Mr. Edwards was intimately involved with the first two gourmet nights, as was Mr. Robert Ralston, who is with us today, and thank you very much, Robert, for being with us. As a matter of fact, both these gentlemen will be at gourmet night uh, Saturday night. Therefore, he was involved with the first gourmet night, which was the last to be held outside the facility, and the second gourmet night, the first to be held in our facility. Additionally, Mr. Edwards worked while in college, and if I remember correctly, would work six months at a place, learn as much as he could, and then move on to another facility. Upon graduation from SMU, where he earned his MBA, he was hired by Mr. Tom Latton, another CPA and another MBA, who was with Laventhal and Horwath at that time. Tom Latton has always recognized quality, and I think he continues to recognize quality to this day. Greg went on to also earn an, a CPA. Another thing I'd like to mention to you, while he was here, I, I did get involved in, in student organizations as a faculty advisor, and he's one of the few people I've ever met when we would have a meeting, I always felt he was trying to manage me, <laughs> rather than my managing him, which I found rather interesting. Most recently, I found out why he's always been so focused and disciplined. He was a gymnast in high school. Gymnasts, you know, have to develop what they call routines or a program. They have to be focused, they have to be disciplined, they have to be strong, yet they have to be flexible. And he's used these skills, I think, throughout his entire career. I would be remiss if I did not tell you he also has a wonderful family. Uh, he's been married for 22 years to a young lady by the name of Jolene, a person by the name of Kathy Shaw, who was a student in our college, introduced them, and they were married in July of 1980. He has three children. His oldest is his daughter, Stephanie, 20 years of age. Gregory is 18, and Jeffrey is 14. Now, one would normally provide a brief history of his career, however, we have asked him to trace his own career from its inception and provide some of his key decisions and his journey that have assisted him in achieving such a successful career. Additionally, he will provide insight into the corporations he has worked for, including a little about Laventhal and Horwath, self-employment, and of course the Irvine Company, the real estate story of the 20th century. If you would, please listen carefully, uh, take notes, you won't be tested, but take notes anyway. For I believe this bright, focused, hard-working, capable young man has much to offer in his remarks on his career journey to date in the hospitality industry. Indeed, he may inspire you, for in reading his speech, I was inspired. Greg, thanks for being here. Would you please welcome warmly one of our very own Mr. Greg Edwards. Thank you very much, Dr. Pohl. Good morning, all. Uh, and you should know that Dr. Pohl is the only pr professor that I could manage. <laughs> Looking, talking to uh, Rabbi Ralston, uh, the good old days for Gourmet Night. I remember we were so nervous about bumping the ticket price from 25 bucks to 35 bucks, and concerned that no one was going to show up. What I'd like to talk about is how I got from where you're sitting out there years ago to being now with one of the, what I call the real estate success story of the 20th century. And as you'll see, we are very involved in hospitality as well. Personal background, Dr. Polk covered this quite, quite a bit. Um, I did begin uh, freshman year at Cornell, however, I was uh, entered in the College of Arts and Sciences and thought it was going to be an easy journey just to transfer over to, into the uh, Hotel College. As you heard, uh, my family does have background in that. However, the transfer got a little bollocked up and I decided to look at some other alternatives, Michigan State and University of Houston being the, the two primary ones, d decided to come here because to me it made most sense to uh, come to a college that was in the city where I could get additional work experience. Uh, as was also explained, um, actually it was Tom Latton who encouraged me to go on and get an MBA uh, at SMU. I did that. He did hire me. Uh, had great time at Laventhal and Horwath. That also broadened and introduced me from hospitality to general real estate uh, experience. 
decided to go out on my own in Dallas um, and did fairly well. Those were kind of heady times in both Houston and Dallas in the late 70s and early 80s and ended up uh, one way or another actually uh, out of a need from clients of writing a, pro a software program that is today still in existence and actually a bit of a market leader. I'm no longer involved in it, but it's called Argus. It's a lease by lease uh, real estate analytical package for office, retail, and, and other type of, of properties. Um, worked so hard that actually by the age of 30 I kind of hit burnout and had two young children and my wife, we d decided uh, together that I should probably get a job in the real world. So I sold the, the uh, software program and moved out to Newport Beach, which is where my family had migrated to and joined the Irvine Company. Uh, that was in December of 84. What I'd like to do is actually tell you less about myself. I'll end up back on some observations um, from what I, what I think I've learned and what I can pass on to you uh, from, from my career path. But I'd actually like to spend most of the time telling you about the tremendous success story, and, and I think there's a, a, a lot of lessons to be learned from this, uh, of the Irvine Company. A little bit of a brief history, talking about how it's stayed intact. We do own uh, two major hotels of Four Seasons in Newport Beach and the Irvine Hyatt. We also own, as you'll see, seven million square feet of retail space, which makes us landlord to seven, to, I'm sorry, to 200 restaurants. And I'll talk to you about what that means from a landlord's perspective of having a number of restaurants on the ranch. Beginning briefly with a little bit of history, uh, James Irvine founded the company um, or actually the land holdings 130 years ago. A uh, little bit of background about Irvine, because if you're in Southern California, you certainly are aware, even though we keep a low profile, but certainly aware of the Irvine Company. Uh, James Irvine made his fortune back in the California Gold Rush, and it wasn't through prospecting. He did it by selling picks and shovels to the prospectors. He took that money and ended up deciding he wanted to invest it for some long-term holdings because he saw how cyclical something like the gold mining business could be. He ended up buying the Irvine Ranch at about 120,000 acres, sight unseen. He lived in San Francisco at the time, and, and he ended up... Uh, later traveling down to, to look at his land holdings and was quite impressed. What this map shows is the, the original Spanish land grants and in the, uh, in the center you can see Rancho, San Joaquin and Lomas de Santiago. Those are the two major sp Spanish land grants that uh, Irvine and his partners purchased. He later bought out his partners and it's basically 10 miles across the Pacific Ocean and 20 miles inland. This more of a satellite view of the ranch um, aerial view shows the perspective of all of Southern California. The ranch is shown in, uh, in the color with our logo in the center. And what's amazing is we're right in the middle of a marketplace that is 18 million people, which is 7% of the U.S. population. If you carve out the L.A. to San Diego and, and rank it as a state, it would rank fourth behind California itself. Texas and New York, but ahead of Illinois and Pennsylvania. So it's an incredible marketplace that we're right in the center of. The other thing that's interesting from a strategic location standpoint is growth sooner or later had to pass through the Irvine Ranch. We're bound by mountains uh, on the inland, in the ocean, uh, down to the southwest. So as growth occurred in San Diego and LA, we're growing toward each other. Uh, growth, basically, th it had to come through the ranch. In addition to the, uh, the strategic location in, in this next... Oops. This next slide was kind of fun putting together. As you can see, if we take the original map boundary, which is the, uh, the, the Spanish land grants and most of the land that we still hold today, on the right, we have fun when we go back to New York and make presentations to the investment bankers because we superimpose and put within the ranch the uh, Manhattan, which, as you can see, comfortably fits within the land holdings. It's also more interesting to superimpose it on West Houston. As you can see, these land holdings will comfortably put a shadow over the vast majority of the whole west of Houston. In addition to our holdings, which I'll go into in a minute, on the ranch, we've also expanded off into, but remained in California because we know the politics, we know the markets, we have contacts 
and worked with tenants in these different areas. So we've gone to Northern California, Silicon Valley, uh, before the tech meltdown, um, we're in West LA and in San Diego County. And basically we have about five and a half million square feet of office and technology space in these other markets and about 5,000 apartments. So about 20% of our investment property portfolio is off the ranch. I'd like to come back though and give you the evolution of the ranch and then later talk about how hospitality fits within that. The really big idea occurred with the master plan, which was the blueprint for building out a brand new city, something that uh, had, had really never been attempted on this scale. And when others attempted it in other market areas, quite often uh, they didn't have the, the financial wherewithal to, to, do, to carry it out. The city of Irvine uh, adopted the master plan in 1969, um, 10,000 acres in the center of the ranch. The boundaries were established basically by some physical uh, characteristics, primarily mountain ranges or, or hills. The important thing was balancing residential communities with business communities, with amenities um, in open space. And putting job growth first was the real key or the genius to the master plan. The key was how do you get the jobs there so that uh, everyone else would follow. As a result, there are four major employment centers that are shown here kind of in the, the darker colors. Uh, around John Wayne Airport, there's a major uh, commercial core. Um, UCI, which is uh, to the lower left that's in color, and then Irvine Spectrum. Uh, and then not shown on here because it's not in the city of Irvine, but down toward the ocean is Newport Center. UCI uh, today has 22,000 students. There's another 10 that are planned for, for in their growth plans. Again, it's right in the, in the center of, of the heart of the ranch. UCI is especially well known for programs in engineering, biosciences, medicine, computer sciences, business, and English. The architects of the master plan uh, in addition to putting jobs first and, and matching up the employment centers with residential and the university, uh, also had to deal with a number of existing factors that were right at our doorstep. There were uh, a major public airport, two Marine Corps air stations, and as you can see by the photos on the lower left, that was the type of, of, of uh, subdivision uh, development that they really did not want to continue on with. What they wanted to incorporate was a higher standard of design, uh, higher levels of consistency, yet maintain flexibility because of the cycles that, uh, that we're going to come up over the next uh, several decades. Result, as a result, when you drive through Southern California, it's clear when you enter the ranch. This just pulls together the, the different pieces, uh, the employment centers in red, the villages in yellow, and then the open space, which is quite important. About half of the uh, 30,000 acres are going to be held in uh, permanent open space. in two main divisions, um, in residential developments, uh, which I'll go through in a minute, where uh, it, they generate an extreme amount of uh, uh, inventory and cash flow by building lots and selling to landowners, and the investment property group, which includes offices, industrials, apartments, hotels, buildings, golf courses. And what I'd like to do is uh, show a very short video and we're going to talk about the business side. If you had a mosaic of what the Irvine Ranch is and you try to describe it, one way I describe that is uh, a necklace. And a necklace that has all different kinds of beads. But each bead would be a village, it might be a business area, it might be a commercial area, tying together the different communities. Ranch 
Ranch is located in the center of Orange County. Its land area comprises about a fifth of Orange County, and it extends 22 miles inland from the Pacific Ocean. On the ranch are the cities of Irvine and part of Laguna Beach, Newport Beach, Tustin, Orange, and Anaheim. The Irvine Company is a company that has been in existence for well over a hundred years. I'd describe the Irvine Company, first of all, as the owner of probably one of the most fabulous pieces of property in Southern California, maybe in the country. But what it became is the master planner and then the master builder of the communities that you now see on the Irvine Ranch. The mission of the company was established in 1960 when the company committed to build a new town around the new University of California that was to be established here. We worked hard to try to tie all of those various elements from open space to recreational areas to educational facilities to the residential areas together in such a way that those who live or work there feel like it's all theirs. It's all part of the communities they live and work in and play in and have fun in and enjoy life. You have the Pacific Ocean. You've got the coastal foothills. You've got the Central Valley. And one of the most magnificent things is that almost no matter where you are, you're aware of canyons and wild landscape just some of the most beautiful land that you could find in Southern California. began to plan this property in 1960. The residential villages were to be diversified. We wanted to have a variety of housing types. That's part of the strings of that necklace that integrates all of it together. We wanted to have a mixture of commerce, that is where people can shop at the neighborhood or regional shopping center. entertainment centers, which we now have in the Irvine Spectrum. We wanted to have smaller recreational areas throughout the ranch where we have places for children to play, small tot lots up to the diamonds where the little leagues will play baseball. The amazing part of the Irvine Ranch is the fact that it has natural habitats, it has canyons, that has groves, that has uh, places where the birds live and nest, where the coyotes dwell. This is part of the history of this property. The original master plan for the 93,000 acres had 11,000 acres of it devoted to open space. Now that number is 50,000 acres, which means that the company has made a commitment to leave open and not develop as much as one half of the entire Irvine Ranch. This is extraordinary. And one of the great values of this open space is the relief it's going to give to the urban communities that it surrounds. It enriches the communities. It defines the communities. It also preserves natural habitats and it provides recreation for the residents that live here. I think history is going to note as much attention was given monetarily and time and planning wise to the open space as it has to the urban development. For more than 40 years the Irvine Company has been guided by a master plan. A plan that's been the foundation for the exceptional quality of life people continue to enjoy on the Irvine Ranch. The diversity of the villages, the educational excellence, the economic vitality, the beauty, it's all here. And best of all, it will be all here for the ages.
is uh, uh, taking this down to the, the level of our business, the general real estate, then quickly get into the hotels and restaurants and the, more specifically the business planning function that I'm involved with. But before doing that, I need to give you some context. Uh, the company has a very unique business model that some other uh, real estate companies have attempted to emulate, but nowhere near as successfully. On the top part of this, you can see in the blue, it tracks our land as we take it from raw land through the entitlement, which is much different than Houston. In California, entitlement means zoning, and it's a very complicated, lengthy legal process. It can take us up to 10 years to get a, a, a new community zoned or entitled before we can actually then uh, have the right to subdivide it and put in the streets, utilities, and, and deliver it to the ultimate users. Uh, tracking along the top, you can see that uh, once we decide whether we're going to sell land or keep it ourselves. And again, the, the uniqueness of the model is we sell only half of the land, we keep the other half. Of the half that we sell, we have different uh, channels of distribution. We can, um, for, from the standpoint of how we sell it, whether it's custom lots, land sold to home builders, or other vehicles. Down on the green, which is how the, the owner of the company has been able to build, build up an incredible investment property portfolio, which if we were publicly held, we would be the fifth largest real estate or hotel company ranked by market cap, which is pretty unique, also considering that there's really only one shareholder. And that, what he's done is he's reinvested all of the cash from the blue side into the equity along with keeping half of the land that's shown through the green bars, which is our, also our equity when we develop properties like the Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, so the magic of this is we've got low bases and no debt on our land, and when we develop the properties, we have low leverage that we need to complete the buildings. This gives us sustainable competitive advantages, having low leverage and, uh, and no debt on, a, on our land or a low basis. Um, in addition, the, uh, the master plan, we balance the residential with the business side, and there's a lot of synergy between the two. The people who live in our apartments or in the houses, shop in the shopping centers, put their local visitors up in the Four Seasons or the Hyatt, they eat at our restaurants, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, complementary nature between the, the two sides of the house. Um, while land inventory is a substantial cash generator, it's also quite cyclical. Um, however, that's counterbalanced by the investment property side where we have long-term leases that run three, five, ten years and balance out the cash flow streams. In addition, from a tax standpoint, our, uh, the tax on our, our land sales generates substantial cash flow, which is heavily taxed, and that's partially offset by the substantial depreciation from the 50 million square feet in our investment uh, property portfolio. On the residential side, you saw in the master plan the villages we've developed 16 to date. That translates into roughly 75,000 homes and apartments. On the housing side, um, the, the folks in our market area in Orange County, Orange County is known to be leading edge for innovative housing design. You can see some of the, uh, the architectural shots here, which are in, the, uh, in our northern communities. We deal with major home builders, uh, DR Horton, Centex, Standard Pacific, Kaufman Broad, Lennar, et cetera. And then we move to the, to the coastal areas. Um, the, it gets quite upscale. Housing there can actually go for north of uh, $400 a, a square foot. We capture about a third of all new home sales uh, on the ranch that, are, that occur within Orange County. We do about 2,200 to 2,500 lot sales a year. And again, that generates substantial cash flow that we take and, and keep entirely within the company and reinvest into the investment portfolio side. Mentioned a couple times the 50 million square feet. It's a rather staggering number, and it's it's also diversified. We're not focusing in just one type. Apartments um, up to 19,000 units. A very wide spectrum of the type of apartment product. Office and technology, 20 million square feet of multi-tenant space. Again, it's a wide array, uh, both near. Uh, freeways and uh, the airport. This is Jamboree Center. Our Irvine Hyatt is, uh, is part of Jamboree Center. 
with the, uh, the large tech boom, we've recently uh, tried to keep pace with that and be innovative, and, and this is our R&D technology two-story tilt-up product, which has been quite successful. We've got a, a campus uh, office uh, park, which is right next to UCI, University of California at Irvine, and what's interesting or innovative about this is we require the university to sign off on all new tenants that sign a lease in here. So, for example, when Cisco wanted to lease some space from us, uh, they needed to have some connection with the with the university, whether it's to uh, through funding or through research, um, scholarships, uh, internship type program. Newport Center Fashion Island, which is where our, our corporate offices are, we own about half of the buildings that are shown here. And uh, the Four Seasons uh, Newport Beach is in the lower right of the of the. Uh, the urban core there. The company also, back in the 60s, developed a big canyon country club, which is in the foreground, and sold off custom lots and a private country club uh, in the foreground. Irvine Spectrum, which is, uh, if you've been to Southern California, where the I-405 and, and I-5 come together in the triangle, this is evolving into a major uh, urban core or downtown area. And today there's about 15 million square feet. We have sold land to, uh, for a double tree, um, a residence in, and a candlewood in this area. And what's interesting is this, in my opinion, will be the last urban core privately funded that I think will ever be built in the United States. And it's only about half built out. We own about 30% of the 15 million square feet uh, that have been developed down there to date. Retail, a broad spectrum, 7 million square feet. As I've mentioned before, uh, we have a number of restaurant tenants, uh, but our retail portfolio is diversified among 17 neighborhood centers, uh, five community centers, uh, three specialty, and three regional centers. We do find, however, that restaurants are key tenants, and there's a, a couple of reasons for this. Um, but of the 200 restaurants, roughly half are, are sit-down, either family or fine dining. We have some tremendously successful restaurant operations uh, within the centers, include uh, two cheesecake factories that do incredible volume, uh, several California pizza kitchens, P.F. Chang's, and virtually all of the, uh, the different fast food uh, chains are, are within our centers. What we found when we look at restaurants is if, if we do our due diligence correctly and we also plan the proper mix so that we don't have uh, folks competing with one another or the menus overlapping, what we found is that uh, restaurants can certainly be profitable tenants as well as amenities. I, initially, I think we went in with the attitude when we went in to, to have a strong leasing plan to attract restaurants. We thought it was primarily going to be an amenity for the people who work in the office buildings, uh, the shoppers, the area residents. And what we found, again, is with the proper due diligence, the credit, the underwriting, looking at the, uh, how, how creditworthy the different uh, either owner-operator chain was, they can, uh, if they do things right, they can be very profitable. Getting into our resort division, which is a separate division unto itself, um, we do own two luxury hotels. We also either ground lease or have sold land for 12 additional hotels on the ranch. Um, we own uh, four championship golf courses, four marinas, and what we found is they also provide very high quality recreational amenities, both for leisure activities and for uh, business amenities. The Four Seasons Newport Beach is, is our upscale. Um, this actually opened in 1986, but it really has uh, a, a timeless design. And one of the things I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking on is, I, I may not have mentioned, but we never do sell any property. Sell is actually a bit of a four-letter word, and that's how this uh, portfolio's been enabled to uh, grow to such a size, and there's been such value created by holding on to the investment property portfolio for long-term appreciation. The, um, this is the only hotel in the Four Seasons chain that Four Seasons themselves markets as an urban resort. As you know, they have a lot of urban properties that, that do quite well in different city centers. They also have a number of very upscale resorts. This kind of 
hits both markets uh, because of its location near the ocean, Fashion Island. Um, and more specifically, it, it receives about 25% of its business from the leisure category, which for an urban property, that's about triple what it may normally do. As a result, it does a good weekend business. We're right in the middle of a major renovation program, uh, eight to $10 million, which is about $25,000 per room, so we're completely renovating uh, uh, top to bottom. And one unique characteristic about this is that the food cost here is actually below 25%. Part of that is uh, this property does a, a fair amount of catering, weddings, et cetera. It also runs the golf club over at Pelican Hill. One interesting, unique challenge that we faced after September 11th was uh, negotiating with the Four Seasons chain. As you know, um, it's been, the, the travel industry has been, uh, was hit very hard in October and November. And what we were wanting to do was to get Four Seasons to change their, their marketing orientation and their rates actually to generate, to get the occupancy level up. Um, even though we are the owner, it was a bit of jawboning working with Four Seasons and getting them to, uh, to be a little bit more flexible on those two points because what they really stress is their image, uh, marketing, and th they think price point sends a large message. The Hyatt Regency Irvine opened in 1985 and has 520 rooms, substantial meeting space. It has a, it's marketed as having the largest ballroom in Orange County. Therefore, it does a lot of group business. The challenge here is uh, it does not do anywhere near the leisure travel, so weekends are a challenge at this property. As a result, Hyatt has been very cooperative with us in creating uh, various uh, aggressive marketing plans, including converting uh, tennis courts to a wedding and event garden. We also have a major renovation, $13 million, which is also about $25,000 per room going on at this property. We own uh, three public golf courses and one private. Two of the public at Pelican Hill overlook the ocean. They are uh, so often compared to Pebble Beach, and all of our courses were designed by uh, Tom Fazio. The, uh, the two courses at Pelican Hill, uh, these courses are ranked third nationally when you look at revenue per round behind Pebble Beach and Pinehurst only. They do a combined average of about 60,000 rounds per year. Uh, the company has been very unique in aggressively marketing the golf courses. Quite often, golf course operators are not known to be good marketeers. And for example, we introduced a uh, player card program for the frequent local players to get a discount. Um, we've signed up almost 2,000 golfers in the last six months. Oak Creek, which is located uh, in Irvine near Spectrum, gets a lot of business play, about 45,000 rounds uh, per year. This is public as well. We recently opened up Shady Canyon is a private golf course which uh, Tom Fazio designed. Um, and this is nestled uh, in an area that's very surrounded by open space. Um, and it's built on about twice the acreage of what a golf course would typically be built on. The custom lots will uh, be surrounding the golf course, only 400 of them, of which we began initial sales. Uh, Mark McGuire bought two of the lots. Homes around this uh, golf course are going to be valued anywhere from $2 million to $10 million. We're constructing a 43,000 square foot clubhouse and recently uh, stole the manager from Turnberry to, uh, to run this club. We also have uh, uh, four marinas that have a little over 100 slips in each. When the company developed Newport Harbor back in the 30s and 40s, it kept the rights uh, to develop the, uh, the marines, which actually we have long-term leases with the county uh, on for the, the access to the water rights. Today, these slips are 98% occupied. There's a waiting list of 500 boat owners um, who would like to move their boats uh, up from San Diego or down from LA because they live uh, in the immediate area. Switching gears somewhat, though, I'd like to talk about what the finance and planning function is, uh, is involved at at the Irvine Company. 
You heard at the end of the video the tagline, good planning goes a long way. And what, what is meant by that is a, a number of folks in the company, resources are dedicated toward planning, making sure things happen, looking at the future, getting there as, as smoothly as we can. And it's broken down into these different areas. Physical planning, which is really architectural, urban planning, determining exactly within the master plan where the street alignments are going to go, what the architectural criteria should be uh, when someone buys a parcel and wants to build a hotel from us. Um, and that was all stressed and I think shown quite well in the video. Product planning is, is taking that to the next step and breaking it down to say, okay, if we have a retail site, what do we want the mix of tenants to be? Uh, what's the proportion of, of restaurants in line, shop space, major anchor space? Market planning uh, gets into uh, tracking on pricing, promotion, customer segmentation, competitive intelligence, and the like. Economic feasibility, which is where we look uh, in depth at what it costs to to build one of our projects and what the likely return on investment will be. Um, there's a group um, that I've been very involved with that is very involved in tracking the numbers. We do a lot of post-mortem analyses on our, uh, our various performance. Financial planning is integrating the budgeting, planning, and operational side all together, both on a short-term and long-term basis. And strategic planning is looking uh, out in the future five, ten years to try to take into account the external factors to the extent that we can accurately uh, try to read that. My group is involved really with the last four in, in one way or another. On the strategic planning side at uh, the Irvine Company, which is what TIC stands for, it really is a continual process versus having everyone drop what they do and spend a month or two on detailed budgets. We like to have things, uh, planning actually more built in and less of a peak throughout the, throughout the year. And there's direct involvement of the chairman owner, Mr. Donald Bren, um, and executive management. What our group does is there's a strategic planning committee that I sit on with the chairman and senior management, and they meet monthly. And what we do is uh, continually look at our goals and our strategies, making sure they tie with the objectives, how are we going to get there, monitor strengths and weaknesses, which is both internal and external. Uh, right now, one of the biggest things with the tech meltdown is making sure that uh, we are, we're, have a good understanding of, of what tenants may need to be moved to smaller spaces. Uh, evaluating threats and opportunities, whether it's competition or if, we're, if we think there's a credit crunch around the corner. And I mentioned earlier uh, post-mortem analyses, which is how we circle back and say how accurate were we. A little bit further into the business planning process, uh, we want to make sure that the goals and objectives are aligned. The, and what that means is our, our goal can be to grow the portfolio from 50 to 60 million square feet. That could be thrown out there by the chairman, but the thing is, do we have a, a clear and understandable path of how we're going to get there? And that's broken down into the small measurable uh, steps that different folks through the operations are held accountable for. Planning for cycles, this is probably as important in real estate as in hospitality. Although Greenspan was real good at smoothing out cycles and allowing us to get through the, the longest uh, peacetime and non-peacetime expansion ever, um, we just went through a, a mild recession. Cycles are inevitable. They're going to occur uh, for a number of different reasons. As a result, what we find is we have to plan for these. However, we also uh, are fortunate to have a very blue chip board of directors, even though we're privately held. We've, uh, Carl Reichardt, who recently retired as the chairman of Wells Fargo, uh, Peter Ubroth, who is the former commission of Major League Baseball, uh, Governor Pete Wilson are all on the board and they advise, uh, they give input, uh, substantial input as to where they see economic cycles heading. Contingency planning is another important thing. The whole thing is, what if we're wrong? And so what we want to have on the shelf is kind of a blueprint for um, different stages, uh, both to the upside as well as to the downside. In other words, what if the market gets more superheated? How can we take advantage of it? How can we accelerate projects? Um, how much do we want to push rates? Upside and downside planning allows us to bracket what we think the, uh, the how reasonable the base plan is. Establishing stretch goals is important uh, for management, and quite often their compensation is tied not as much to the plans as it is to stretch targets. 
And then confirming the business purpose and mission and circling back if we run through this on a kind of a continuous basis and said, are we sure we know where we're going and, and how we're going to get there? I'd like to wrap up with just some personal observations. Although this sounds a bit like the Boy Scout motto, uh, Dr. Paul asked me to talk a little bit about keys to success. Um, and, and what I've kind of, with some look back, uh, both from here through career, some things that I, uh, I could pass on. And the first is, is to be honest and as well as forthright. And what that means is you must trust your judgment, speak honestly and forthrightly. Uh, and what I found in the environment I'm in now is, is that's worked quite well, paid off quite well. Management over time builds up increasing trust and respect for your judgment. Sometimes the truth is painful, but you'll gain more credibility by speaking uh, the truth in such circumstances uh, than by looking the way, other way. Focus your time. Uh, there are too many distractions around uh, to, to not do this. Uh, in many cases, uh, by focusing on the analysis of the real estate dynamics in my own personal case has led to uh, being with one of the largest real estate companies and having a, a, a very uh, responsible uh, position there. Work hard, be consistent, be persistent, I'm sorry. Um, obviously, if you've gotten this far, you've, you know what that's all about. Choose and pursue your career with a passion. Uh, it's what you'll end up spending the vast majority of your hours doing. Enjoying your work is important. It does show, and it also reflects on the other parts of, of your life. Deal and communicate with others effectively. Particularly as you move into management, this is very important. As you know, the, the classic definition of management is getting things done through other people. And dealing with them and, effective, and communicating effectively is uh, really the corollary to the honesty and forthrightness. Um, learn to analyze the details. Uh, quite often, uh, you'll hear the saying over and over, the devil's in the details. That is, is really where the incremental profit uh, is to be found. Don't be afraid to innovate. What I mean by that is not to take any, uh, make any reckless, uh, wild recommendations. Innovation that I've seen often occurs very gradually and incrementally. And as you get, take one step at a time, you'll take a step, back test it, see whether or not it worked, make a course correction, do some more innovation, and move on. Now switching to the challenges. Understanding your true priorities. As you grow older, it will become more apparent that, that there are choices and trade-offs that you have to make. Um, balancing family life with career is certainly one. Balancing career risk with return. As Dr. Paul mentioned, I was on my own for a while. Those were great times. Enjoyed them tremendously. Um, but, but there was also a, a, a real trade-off in risk and return there. Seek objective advice about yourself. Uh, Finding good mentors, I, I know you've all heard this, but it really is important to people that you can connect to that will take an ownership in, in where you're going and give you uh, objective feedback on how, how are you doing on getting to, that, to those milestones. Informal advice from trusted peers is another part of the feedback loop. And then uh, probably the most important thing is to try to continue to surround yourself with people that are better than you are. In a corporate environment, there's actually, uh, this is something that people are often afraid to do for political reasons. However, you'll end up growing quite a bit more if you surround yourself with people that are better than you are. Finding and keeping the best professionals in a, in a, uh, a tight uh, job market like we've been through in Southern California, um, it, you may be able to attract good people, but the question is, can you hang on to them? and then continuing your personal growth uh, throughout your career. Finally, I'd like to go through uh, six lessons learned to, to pass on to you. The first, uh, which is probably the most important, is how you think is, is everything. Uh, but the tagline is, what you say should be edited from what you think. This is a lesson I learned rather early on in my career um, when I came out of school thinking you kind of know it all and, and you want to tell everyone that, you'll find out very quickly that you don't. Um, and you should actually be listening 90% uh, of the time. A little quote from uh, President LBJ, if two men agree on everything, then only one is doing the thinking, is something that I think is quite true. 
control your own destiny, or as Jack Welch has said, who's the retired chairman of General Electric, or someone else will. You must take responsibility for where you're going in the world, and therefore control what you want to do. Now certainly, life can throw you different curveballs, uh, and therefore you must remain flexible to, to still try to get to your eventual goal. Learn from your mistakes. Obviously, the, the first step in doing this is to admit that you've made a mistake, and sometimes people's ego gets in the way of allowing them to do that. One of my favorites is fix the problem, not the blame. In other words, when something comes up and needs attention, uh, again, in, in certain corporate environments, quite often you can get into finger pointing, uh, which is very counterproductive and breaks down uh, people working together. What, uh, what I found that works the best is to jump in, find the root cause, learn from it, and get it fixed and move on. A quote from Lou Holtz I thought was a bit uh, apropos. The one who complains about the way the ball bounces is likely the one who dropped it. Manage others as if uh, you need them more than they need you. The two points here is authority through earned trust versus position. And again, as you move up the ranks, you'll find that your position just automatically will command certain authority. There's a difference between having authority versus respect from the people that you work around, whether they're above, up here, or below you. So what's important is to always uh, maintain an environment of mutual respect. <coughs> And finally, uh, never stop learning. Continue to invest in yourself, whether it's real hard dollars, time, relationships, learning some new techniques, skills, learning a different industry. Uh, it's something you should continue to challenge yourself to do. And finally, harking back to something that I had, had mentioned earlier is, as you never stop learning, continue to open doors and pursue your passion. to take any questions if there are any. Everyone's still awake. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in regards to your education, what were some of the skills that were expected from work but were not covered or taught in your education when you first started? Skills that were expected but not necessarily taught. I, I'm not sure there wasn't anything not taught. What I would answer that is is more broadly, which is uh, communication. Um, uh, nothing would be emotional maturity, which I don't think it is up to a college to teach. Uh, and uh, general problem analysis, recognition, and problem solving. I don't think there were any specific uh, skills that we're lacking at all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I realize it would uh, vary greatly depending upon where you are in Irvine, but what's the average house uh, square foot and what's it, the average cost? Yeah, it's pretty pricey. When I moved from Dallas to, New to Irvine in 84, a long time ago, and then our house had since more than doubled, uh, I had sticker shock. Um, and we sold our house in Las Colinas, moved from Irving to Irvine at, I don't know, it was an 1,800 square foot home that we sold in 84 for $90,000 and we moved into a $200,000 house that was not much larger and it was, like I say, sticker shock. Today, um, homes go for roughly, uh, in the north part of the ranch, a new home would go for about $200 a square foot. And then as you get down with coastal views, that more than doubles. The, the typical home size, are, there isn't a typical, uh, anywhere from 1,500 square feet on up. Commensurate with that, though, the employers know that they've got to pay people so that they can afford a nice place uh, to live. And so everything is kind of indexed. Are you all strict about what companies or what who 
people that come to buy land from there, are y'all strict about who you get to stay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a, a big, thick, uh, well, there's both CC&Rs, which are restrictive covenants, um, and, and then uh, as far as the people have to comply once they've either signed a lease or, or bought land from us. Um, however, if someone has the balance sheet to, to come in and, and establish a business, we'll certainly want to talk to them and likely do business with them. Can you speak uh, how the deregulation of uh, energy in California has affected your uh, business plan? Sure. Um, a little over a year ago, we were in a, a, one of our panic drills over the, the uh, thought that the lights were going to go out in California. It obviously did not happen. Um, we were fortunate in that we had some contracts with PG&E and others that went uh, a couple years ago and made us then look smart that provided for long-term uh, pricing and availability of energy. And we also had, had earlier put in some backup generators at both of our hotels and some of our other shopping centers. Um, so it's something that kind of, it hit. Uh, we we went into kind of alert mode, but it's it's passed since. One more question. Sorry, have you found that the restaurant failure rate plan like that, less than uh, definitely. Part, part of it is uh, we keep pretty high standards for uh, for kind of the price of admission, if you will. And, and in our underwriting criteria, when we go through the leasing analysis, uh, that has something to do with it, even though we have allowed a whole number of other restaurants to open up. But yeah, I would say the failure rate is, is, is pretty low. Again, thank you very, very much. I'd like to again thank everyone for being here. It's, it's always nice to see a large turnout, and I, I believe, at least I'm a very positive and believe it was well worth your, your being here. Uh, we have one other thing we'd like to do, and uh, we'd like you to uh, have a, have you see us do this. Uh, we do have something to present to to Mr. Greg Edwards, and if I may read this to Mr. Edwards, uh, this is the Conrad and Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management, University of Houston. In honor of Gregory S. Edwards, we hereby award this certificate of appreciation for participating in the Eric Hilton Distinguished Lecture Series on March 21st, 2002. Thank you very much. We also have a, a, a first, and I'd like to walk you over here. Don't walk. You have to go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to have uh, have you have a seat, if you would, please. <laughs> this is not your name yet. Uh, this is the first time this has been done. Uh, I've been accused by uh, Mr. Eric Hilton of never being in my chair. And I decided, or we decided, Mr. Zinzer and the good dean, and Mr. Franco, allowed us to get a chair. So Mr. Edwards is now the surrogate Eric Hilton <laughs> Distinguished Chair. And wherever he is, he'll probably be using it. And if I get accused of not using it, I can tell Mr. Hilton that we have surrogate chairs around the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You will be getting a chair mailed to you. The <laughs> <laughs> checks in the mail. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you all for coming, staying awake, and, and finally, best of luck in your career here and out at, uh, when, when you get beyond the doors here. Thanks. <laughs>